Hey, how's it going guys? My name's Daniel, aka Hashlips, and in today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to create dynamic NFTs simply by making a few changes in the smart contract. This video is going to be for more experienced developers because I'm briefly going to go over the contract itself, explaining what's happening. If you are new to my channel, I teach people how to code, and currently we are focused on blockchain technologies and NFTs in particular. <laughs> If you want to know how to make NFTs from scratch, then check the videos in this channel, start with this featured video, and I promise you will learn a ton. If you get stuck with any of the code being shown, go and join our Discord group. You can go to this website, hashlips.online, and you can go and join Discord, and there's all the social media links, and there's thousands of developers that's ready to help. Let's get going, and let's take a look at how can we make an NFT more dynamic to give you a good understanding of what we will be talking about today, I want to go into this collection, the Sketchy Pages. Now, the Sketchy Pages collection is an interesting collection. And basically what it comes down to, if you read in the description, is that people can add dynamic messages to this NFT, basically. And at the end of the day, once someone adds a message, the page actually populates. It shows a different image. But how does that logic set up in a smart contract and is it easy to do? Of course it is, and I'll show you guys how to do this exactly. We're going to start off by looking at how the contract is set up. If you want to get to the contract of any NFT, you can simply click on it on OpenSea, scroll down to the details page and click on the contract address over there. This will open Etherscan. And as long as this contract is verified, you can simply read all the contents inside of it. We will get to that in a second. What I do want to show you is that we can actually read this message of this NFT. If we go to the read contract section and we scroll down to read message, we can simply click there and query the token that we want to read the message from, click enter, and we can see this message says, welcome to the ape family. This is very cool to read the messages of an NFT, but you can also set the message if you are the owner of this NFT. If we go to the write contract section and we click on this function, set message, you can see that there's an option to set a new message for this NFT that the person owns. And this is pretty cool because it's not a normal NFT. This NFT acts like a physical page where it can contain a message on the blockchain. Now the message is capped, I believe, at like around 200 characters because you cannot save a lot of data on the blockchain without paying tremendous amounts of gas. What's unique with this collection is that there's no mint button. There's only this claim button over here. And how this works is it fits in with the ecosystem of the Sketchy A Book Club NFT collection. I quickly just briefly want to go over what the Sketchy A Book Club NFT is. It's basically hand-drawn artworks of these PFP profile picture NFTs looking like these apes. They look pretty chilled and it's pretty cool. But what's interesting about them is if you own at least three NFTs, three sketchy apes, you can rightfully claim a sketchy apes page, a sketchy page. Owners can claim as many sketchy pages as they want. There's a hard cap of 30,000 pages. It also serves as a double utility, giving access for people owning the pages to have access to the live auction that will take place after everything is sold out of the original artworks. So you can see how these NFTs play a crucial role in the ecosystem of an NFT or a collection. Now that we have a good understanding of the project itself, we can now dive into the code. And that is good because we need to have a good understanding of what we are looking at and how it needs to be implemented. For instance, how do we get to saying that a person needs to own a certain amount of another collection to claim this collection? These are things that we are going to look at now. I want you to go to the code section of this sketchy pages contract. Then scroll all the way down until you start seeing the actual implementation of the ERC 721 contract. The contract will say sketchy pages 
And the reason why we only need to focus on this contract is because the rest of the code above is all just libraries and the ELC721 standard as well as ownable and the things needed to make this work. Now, we can focus on this because this is where the bulk of the logic lives and I'm going to show you the exact pieces, walk through this whole contract line by line so you understand how it was implemented and how you can implement something like this for yourself or your own project. I find the best way of learning code is actually walking through it step by step. This is a great way for yourself as a developer to get used to Solidity smart contracts as well. So let's go ahead and look at this smart contract. We'll start off on this first line. This is the Sketchy Apes contract and we can see that it's inheriting from the ERC721 enumerable as well as the ownable contract. Now this is good, means it's nice and secure and there has been talks going around the community about the enumerable taking a lot of gas. Maybe we can look at how to implement the ELC enumerable a bit differently to save on gas cost. But for now, we're going to leave it as it is. Next, we have this using strings for UN256. This is just to easily convert UN values into strings, maybe to return it in the URI later on. We then have a bunch of variables. Firstly, the base URI. This is going to be the URI, which usually is IPFS, where your metadata is stored. We also then have a required amount, and this required amount is not something that you mint, but it's actually the required amount of NFTs needed to claim this particular NFT. And the value is set to 3. Next, we have the max char limit. This is a limit that's applied for when the owner sets a new message to this NFT, to this page, so to speak. We have to set it low because, like I said before, the blockchain is not designed to hold a lot of data. But because we are saving string data on this blockchain, we need to limit the person from entering too many characters and save them on gas cost. We also have a paused variable to pause the contract execution as well as the not revealed URI. We will play around with the base URI and the not revealed URI and interchange them based on the logic of the current state of this NFT. So this is an important factor. Lastly, we have the SABC address. This is actually the sketchy a book club address because we need to get the amount that an owner owns and if it's above the required amount, then and only then can someone mint one of these pages. That's it for our variables. Now, let's look at our more complex structures. So, obviously, these two are also variables, but I consider them as new to this NFT, and that's why I want to talk about them separately. We have got this unique page, struct. Now, a struct is a custom data type that you can design how it looks. For our struct, we're calling it a page, and it consists of one string, which is the message. We then have a mapping, and this is a mapping of UN256 to different pages, referring to our struct up here. We're going to call this mapping the pages, and we will essentially, every time someone claims one, assign that integer to a certain page. That way, we will know which NFT's data, its kind of extra data, gets updated. In this contract, there is a constructor. So when it's launched initially or deployed, we give it a name, the symbol, the base URI, as well as the not revealed URI address. Then, we give it the initial address to the SABC address, the contract already existing on the blockchain. When this kicks off, we set them using setter functions over here. We set the base URI, the not revealed, as well as the SABC address. These are all functions that can be located right here at the bottom. All these functions are only callable by the owner. So we have got the set SABC address and this setter is necessary for if in case we ever need to change it. Then the not revealed URI gets set, the required amount can change, as well as the set character limit, and then also the base URI and the paused state. Lastly, we have a withdrawal function, 
for if we want to withdraw the Ether in the smart contract. So going back up to our constructor, we can see that these functions get called to set our initial state. We have one internal function over here, and this is basically just returning to us the current base URI. Then we get the most important function of this smart contract. This is the claim function. Now basically, what this is going to do is it's going to check another smart contract to see if an owner at least owns enough NFTs to freely claim this one. Let's walk through it step by step. On the first line of execution, we have a require statement. We check if this contract is paused or not. If it is, that's the first indicator that we will stop execution. If it's not, it will continue. If it passes the paused require statement, we have to check if the person trying to claim indeed has enough of another NFT sitting in another contract. So how can we check that? Well, we use the ERC721 standard for all NFTs. So we're going to make this token variable of type IERC, the interface of an ERC721 contract. Then we are instantiating it like this, saying to this piece of code that look at this address and we want to pull the values from that into this token variable so we can use it throughout this code. Now we have a reference to the SABC token, the Sketchy A Book Club NFT token on the blockchain. The reason why we do this in the claim function is for if we have set a new address so that it pulls in the most recent one. Now we can basically get the tokens owned from the token over here and the balance of the sender. This will save it into a integer value and we can simply have a require statement over here to check if the owned amount is greater or equal to our required amount that we've specified up here. If this passes and only if it passes, then the person is going to be able to mint. After that passes, we do a simple check for the total supply. Make sure that if we claim one that it's less than 30,000, which is the max supply. Then we go and do something special. We create a new page by specifying the struct type, its type of memory because it's only temporary. We give it a name new page and this is how you instantiate a struct. We simply supply an empty string because that is required from our structure over here. Just one value. So after it's been instantiated, what we do next is take the pages mapping which we have created here. Then we go and add the supply plus one because that will be the determining factor for where it's saved in the mapping, which integer kind of slot, and then we assign it to our new page. Meaning that this mapping will be filled with pages every time someone claims an NFT. Lastly, and only lastly, we do a safe mint to the message uh, message.sender, the owner's wallet, and we mint that exact NFT. If all this is successful, we should have an NFT assigned to someone as well as have some dynamic linkage in the pages mapping. The pages mapping has nothing to do who owns the NFT, but it's simply a reference to the pages struct and based on the ERC721 structure and its way of knowing who owns what token, this is perfectly fine. So that is how we mint and make something link to a mapping, which we can later change. Next, we got this function wallet of owner. Basically, this just loops through the mapping or the array, and we get back all of the tokens that a owner owns. This is an old function, so I'm not going to go through it. I only want to focus on the new things that's implemented to make you see how you can use dynamic values with NFTs. The next function indeed touches on that. In the token URI function, this is where the switch happens. So what switch am I talking about? Well, if we can remember in OpenSea, we had these pages and one page was showing text and one wasn't. So when we jump back to the code, this is exactly where that switch happens. We check for if the token even exists 
If it doesn't, it stops the execution. If it does exist, we go and grab a page in memory, which is temporary, call it the current page and grab it from the token URI that was supplied. Then we go and check if this message of the page was empty. We refer to it as the current page dot message because a page, remember, has a message field. So once that message is not empty, meaning that it contains some kind of message the user added, we can return the base URI, which is the image with the text written on it. If this doesn't pass, we're going to return the not revealed URI, which is technically the one without text. And that's how simple this is. This is great, but how do we set the message? Well, that's why we have a set message function. It takes in a token ID as well as a message that we would like to publish. Now, it does require the owner to be the actual owner of this page. Then we save the message and convert it into bytes. This is needed so that we can check the length and make sure that it doesn't surpass our character limit. Only once it surpasses these requirements, then we go ahead and save this page, this time we're referring it to in storage. The reason why we don't use a temporary variable because it's easier to then update the current page in its location saved in storage. So we simply have to take the current page and refer to its message assigning the new message. Lastly, we have a read message function which takes the token ID. It refers to the page again as current page in memory for a temporary view. This is because we just want to read the message. We then return a string and that's going to be the current message and this function is open to anyone who wants to read what the message says. This is not a secretive message these pages because nothing on the blockchain is really secret. But that is it. So now you know how to adapt a contract to make it dynamic by adding a struct and adopting it and saving it in a mapping. I am very excited to see what the community is going to come up with and create. This is very exciting stuff, but please keep in mind, I make these tutorials just for educational purposes. I highly urge you before deploying any content or any smart contract on the blockchain to have it fully reviewed by a professional. Because security is number one and you need to make sure that your contract is secure against hackable attacks. That being said, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please leave me a like, a comment and subscribe for more content. If you like the way that I reviewed my smart contract and you would like me to show off other smart contracts, maybe review it, let me know in the comments. I would gladly do so. Till next time guys, see you in the next video.